celebration of you moms this week. And I know that many times when we look in Scripture, we can see some really awesome examples of women in ministry, of moms in ministry. And I've been blessed over the last 22 years to get to serve with many of you uh, ladies here on our church staff as well as within our ministry. Uh, Over the last 20 years, uh, it's been amazing, but we've had about 60% of our staff, paid staff, are all females. And I would dare say that the best leaders that I've ever rubbed shoulders with have been women. And it is such a blessing to get to work with you. Uh, On a weekly basis, I get to see you serve uh, in 4640 on Tuesday and Wednesday nights. Uh, I always try to make it a point during services to get back into the classrooms and at least poke my head in and see all you ladies working with our children's ministry, uh, working in our bookstore, in our coffee shop, ushers and greeters, in our tech ministry. And you guys are awesome, and we love you, and thank you for being a part of Fellowship Church and serving so faithfully here. In fact, I want to give you a hand for how awesome you are, because we would not be a church without you. When we look in Scripture, though, there are some amazing women that we can learn so much from uh, just as, we, as you're having your coffee with God. I mean, as you're, as you're reading the Scriptures, you can see women like Sarah and Miriam and Rahab and Ruth and Naomi and Hannah and Mary and Martha. And it is really cool to be able to look at how God used those women in great ways. But this morning we're going to look at two specific ladies, maybe you've heard of them before, maybe you haven't, but that have incredible stories. Two women in particular that are found in Judges chapter 4. Now for us to understand this scripture, we kind of need to understand where Israel was during this time of Judges. And chronologically, Judges falls, it goes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. And Judges happens right after the book of Joshua, historically, where Joshua brings the children of Israel into Israel. They conquer the land, and they set up the tribes in the different areas of the land. And then after that, they set up judges. Judges who will rule over the land, kind of like kings, kind of like uh, uh, spiritual advisors. And throughout the book of Judges, you, there, there's listed many, many that we've heard of maybe growing up in Sunday school, like a Samson. Maybe you've heard of Gideon. But there's a lot of different judges that rule during that time throughout Israel. But there's also a cycle that Israel gets caught in. And this particular cycle, it it seems like they just go round and around with it, starts off with them serving God. Everything Everything is great. They're on top of this circle. Everything's awesome. God's favors and blessing is upon them. But as they go on, they fall into sin. And with Israel, what is the biggest sin that they struggled with? Idolatry. It seems like they would be doing fine, and then all of a sudden, they would start worshiping idols and worshiping false gods, which hurt God to the core because God had done so much for, for, for his, this country, for so much for this people and delivering them out of slavery. And yet they would always fall back into uh, uh, some type of, of idolatry or sin. So they would be serving, they would sin, and then they would be enslaved as a result of their poor decisions— A neighboring country would come in and take over, whether it was the Philistines or the Canaanites or whatever, and they would enslave the children of Israel until they would cry out. So they would be at the bottom of this circle. They would be be down, distraught. They would would be in slavery, and then they would decide, okay, now I'm going to cry out to God. Now I am going to uh, ask God for help. And we've all been there, right? We've all been in our own cycles of life. Things have happened to us uh, where we were just not doing well. Some tragedy hit. Something hit in our life. Maybe we weren't living the way we were supposed to. So we cry out to our Heavenly Father. And Scripture says when we do that, He will respond. And in every situation in Judges, the people would cry out. And then He would raise up a judge that he could lead and rule through to bring deliverance for the country. So they would raise up a judge, then God would deliver them from whoever their captors were, and then they would be, after that, they would serve God again. So this cycle just happens over and over through the book of Judges. And when we look at a particular judge by the name of Deborah, 
We find her, she's right in between Ehud and Gideon as far as the timeline is concerned. And so Deborah is one of these women that we're going to be looking at today. And we find her story in Judges chapter 4. The Bible says, after Ehud's death, the Israelites again did what was evil in the Lord's sight. So judge dies, they do evil. So the Lord handed them over to King Jabin of Hazor, a Canaanite king. Okay, so they get, it, they get enslaved. The commander of his army was Sisera. Sisera, who had 900 iron chariots. Now understand during this time, if, if you had an army of chariots, you had quite an army. Chariots during that time were like the tanks of World War II. The more chariots you had, the more powerful your army was. Sisera had 900 iron chariots, ruthlessly, he ruthlessly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. Deborah, the wife of Lapidoth, was a prophet who had become a judge in Israel. She would hold court under the palm of Deborah, which stood between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came to her to settle their disputes. One day she sent for Barak. She said to him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Assemble 10,000 warriors from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun and at Mount Tabor. I will lure Sisera, commander of Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors to the Kishon River. There I will give you victory over him. So at this point... Deborah has been raised up as a judge. God now is calling her to action. He's calling her to a point where Israel will see deliverance. So she calls in the general of the, of the army of Israel, and she gives him advice on what he should do. Now, there's an incredible anointing there. This woman was a judge. Yes, she had great discernment from God, but she was not a military leader. She was not a military general, general yet she spoke with great authority. She had this great favor with the people. And that's the way God is. If God calls you to do something, he will anoint you to do it. And you will know things that you never thought you knew before. All of a sudden, God gave Deborah this really cool empowerment to where she now was speaking as if she was the military leader. And we see the story continue in verse 8. Barak told her, I will go, but only if you go with me. Now, this reveals either that Barak knew that Deborah had this great anointing on her. Maybe he understood Israel, Israel's history, and if, if, if the prophet was with the army, if God was with the army, that, that they, would, we, they would be successful. And so he wanted her to come with him. Or maybe he was just a wuss. Maybe he just didn't want, knew that he couldn't do it on his own. So he needed her to come. But it's interesting, her response. She says, very well. I will go with you, but since you have made this choice, you will receive no honor, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. At Kadesh, Barak called together the tribes of Zebulun, Naphtali, and 10,000 warrior, uh, warriors marched up to him. Deborah also marched with them. Verse 12, then Sisera uh, was told that Barak had gone up to Mount Tabor. He called for all 900 of his iron chariots and all of his warriors, and they marched from Harasheth Hagiam to the Kishon Valley, or Kishon River. Then Deborah said to Barak, Get ready. Today the Lord will give you victory over Sisera, for the Lord is marching ahead of you. So Barak led his 10,000 warriors down the slopes of Mount Tabor into battle. When Barak attacked, the Lord threw Sisera and all his charioteers and warriors into a panic. Then Sisera leaped down from his chariot and escaped on foot. Barak chased the enemy and their chariots all the way to Harasheth uh, Hagim, killing all of Sisera's warriors. Not a single one of them was left alive. Now understand this picture. You have all these Israelites who are under-equipped. They don't have tanks, right? They don't have the tank of the day, which is the chariot, but this other army does. So it is literally like all these guys are running down there shooting BB guns at tanks. But God is the one that is before them. He's the one that brings them into a state of chaos and causes them to, to, to flee. And that's, that's what's going on in this scripture. Meanwhile, Sisera ran to the tent of Jael. 
the wife of Heber, the, the, the Kenite, because Heber's family was on friendly terms with King Jabin of Hazor. Be, uh, Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come into my tent, sir. Come in. Don't be afraid. So he went into her tent, and she covered him with a blanket. Please give me some water, he said. I, I'm thirsty. So she gave him some milk to drink and covered him again. Stand at the door of the tent, he told her. If anybody comes and asks you if there is anyone here, say no. Now notice he asks for a glass of water. What does she give him? A glass of milk. And everybody knows if you drink a glass of milk, it can make you a little seepy, right? So she's got a plan here. But when Sisera fell asleep from exhaustion and a little milk, Jael quietly crept up to him with a hammer and a tent peg. Then she drove the tent peg through his temple and into the ground, so he died. When Barak came looking for Sisera, Jael went out to meet him. She said, come and I will show you the man you were looking for. So he followed her into the tent and found Sisera lying there dead with the tent peg through his temple. So on that day, Israel saw God subdue Jabin, the Canaanite king. And from that time, Israel became stronger and stronger against King Jabin until they finally destroyed him. Did you know that was in the Bible? Isn't that cool that God used these two women, very, very different women, to deliver an entire country? And the way she, I mean, God, I know, I, I think that's really cool that she, she, she did that with the stake and the, and the hammer. I, I don't know, I, maybe I'm just into match action movies or something. But like, this has got everything in it. This could be a major motion picture. And, and, and there's no love stories. That's the best part. It's just all action. <laughs> but what can we learn, ladies? From this story, what can we learn from these, in two, these two empowered women that were used of God? Well, the first thing that we can learn is that we just need to make sure that we're listening to God. Listen to God. Deborah was this prophet. She was also a judge. This meant that all the people of Israel would come to her and they would have their cases heard before her. During these days, the judges depended totally on God's voice to make any decisions that they may need to make. And if Deborah didn't listen to God, it would not only affect her, but also everyone around her. So, so Deborah had to listen to God. She needed him for wisdom and discernment. Jael was guided by the Lord to, to take out this evil general. She had to listen to God for her to be able to do that. And it's the same with us. We can get in huge messes if we aren't listening to God's voice. Just last week, I, was, I had the opportunity to speak at, on Tuesday and Wednesday night in 4640, and I talked to the students about why there seems to be these groups of people out there, some that are blessed and some that are not. Why there are these groups of people out there that they can, be, they can come from the same parents, yet the, the, the offspring of those parents, some can go down a road of destruction and have a life of misery and, and no favor, and the other side can be blessed and favored and protected. And we talked about what, what was the difference there? Well, one of the biggest differences is that those that are blessed listen to God. They are guided by him. When we look at most people's issues and problems, many times we can trace them to some poor decision where we didn't listen to God. And that's what happens with these two women. That's why they're blessed. That's why they're favored by, favored by God is because they listen to him. That's why the theme of the first part of this year is make sure that you have coffee God, with God. Make sure you're reading his manual for life so that we can listen to him and we can make wise decisions. So they listen to him. But when the time came, they also stepped up. They stepped up. When the time came for them to serve, they did. They didn't wait around for some guy to do the job. They didn't wait around for somebody that maybe looked more equipped to the, do the job. They did the job. Now, notice in this scripture, I know that a lot of times we can read scriptures and go, well, man, does that kind of contradict God's message? Because we teach so much here about understanding God's authority and staying under God's uh, 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 cover, right? We, we talk about that. And in this story, you might look and you might go, well, JL really didn't stay under her husband's authority in this situation because he was loyal to the king, yet she killed the king's general. But remember, 
The only time it's okay to step out from underneath authority is when that authority asks you to do something that's against God's law or God's word. And this general Sisera and his king Jabin were all about destroying the country of Israel and destroying his people. That's why Jael in this situation, it, she was still under God's cover even though she dis, may have disobeyed her husband, which is really, really cool. So step up when the time comes. Look for an opportunity. Don't... Here's the thing. With our society and with things that are going on, it's very easy for us to just go, I'm too busy. I'm going to wait for things to slow down. I'm going to wait for after baseball season or after soccer season or I'm going to wait, wait until after this comes up or, or, my, my, or everything. You know what? It, nothing slows down. Our life never slows down. And so it doesn't matter with where we're at. We need to be looking for an opportunity, if God gives it to us, to step up and serve in a mighty way. Because if we don't, God will find somebody else to serve. Here's the other thing we see is that God had a plan, and these women followed it. And when God gives you a plan, he will always equip you for his plan. He'll always equip you for it. Now, notice this, that, that with Deborah, so she had to make all these judgment calls, and she had to make wise decisions. So what did she do? She relied on God's discernment to give her wisdom. She used the gifts that she had. Jael did the same thing. In that day, it was the woman's responsibility to set up and tear down the tent. So she knew very well how to hand her, handle a hammer and a stake. And she used what God gave her in that situation. Look for what the gifts that God has given you. Look for the things that he's given you. And know that he's not going to call you to do something that he doesn't equip you for. He's going to gift you for that. He's going to equip you for it. Now you just have to look and see, what, what can I bring to the table? What can, how can I serve? Well, all you have to do is look towards your gifts and your talents, and you know how you've been made to serve. God didn't give you those things just so you can make a living. God just, God, he didn't just give you those things just to be nice. He gave you those things because he formed you in your mother's womb he knitted you together according to Scripture, and he called you according to his purpose for your life. So find out what that is. If you teach, teach. Lead a small group. If it, maybe, you're, maybe you're good with technology. That's the kind of world that you're in. Then volunteer in our tech ministry. Maybe you just have a spirit of, of, of compassion. Then, then, then be a part of like a, a hospital ministry here at the church. Or, or, or maybe you, you, you're a part of our prayer team. Maybe you're really, really good with kids. So you're part of our children's ministry. Whatever it is, use God's gifts that he's given you for him. That's what he wants. So they had a plan. Then they seized the moment. They seized the moment. God brought this ministry straight to jail's home. Now you might think, well, ministry, he drove a stake through a guy's head. Are you kidding me? It's ministry. It's leadership. It's an opportunity to serve God in a way. And she took the opportunity that she had and she used it. Now, there's something that happens uh, with moms in today's society. And I, and I know there's several emotions that you guys can struggle with from time to time. We all can. But one of those emotions is th th that we have is guilt. Girls are really good with feeling the emotion of guilt, especially when it comes to our family. Now, for you as a mom, you have either been called into the workforce, so you work in the workforce, or you have been called to be a stay-at-home mom. But isn't it interesting, that regardless of what, where you have been called to serve, how you will feel guilty because you're not in the other area. Those of you that work in the workforce, you feel guilty because you're not home with your kids enough. Maybe that's what, you, maybe that's what you're feeling. If you're at home with the kids, you may feel guilty because you don't feel like you're bringing home any money for the family. And so it's just this wicked game the devil plays on your head. But the truth is, is God has called you according to his purpose. If that's in the workforce, look for an opportunity to minister. If it's at home, look for an opportunity to minister. And don't feel bad about it. Don't let the devil make you feel guilty because you're in one or the other area. You may go through seasons of life where there's times you were in the workforce and there's times you were at home. So don't feel bad about that. Just look for opportunities to serve God in the middle of it. That, that's what you have to do. And in our story, the really cool thing is that Deborah is in the workforce. JL is a stay-at-home mom. Yet God used both of them equally to take down a kingdom. 
Isn't that incredible? That's so awesome. And so I look to you moms and I say, if you're in the workforce, thank you. Thank you for the work that you do. I understand that for a lot of families, they can't live off of a single income anymore. So you're in the workforce. Thank you so much. And do not feel guilty for that. And if you're a stay-at-home mom, thank you for that. That is a full-time job and more. And you are going to be blessed for what you do because that is a tough job. In fact, we found a video this week where the working force is trying to hire somebody with the job description of a mom, and this is what it looks like. Work at home or you work in the workforce, thank you for all you do. You're awesome. Well, the other thing that we notice about these two women's, women is that they knew who was on their side. That was one of their secrets to success, is they knew who was on their side. In verse 6, Deborah says, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Get ready. Today the Lord will give you victory over Sisera, for the Lord is marching ahead of you. They had absolutely nothing to fear, because they knew God was in control. Now here's another emotion for, for most women that they struggle with. Yes, it's guilt. A lot of times it's worry, but many times it's fear. We're just, we're afraid of the future. We're afraid of what's going to happen. We're fearful for our kids. We're fearful for the decisions that we're making, they're making. I mean, we can just be fearful. But, but according to this scripture, we don't need to worry about that because God is on our side. The creator. He made everything. The Bible says that if he's in our, on our side, just like the song we said earlier, whom then shall we fear? God's going to do battle for you anyway. He loves you. He wants to see you successful. According to Scripture, you, Christ came that you might have life and have it to an abundance. God loves you, and he's on your side. And when you look at life like that, and you look at problems like that, and you realize that God loves you so much that he would defeat a nation for you, he would send his son to die for you, whom then Shall you fear? No one. So they knew who was on their side. And the last thing that we see that Deborah does here is that she praises God when he gets the victory. Love how God promotes praisers. I taught on, uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday night. I told those students, which if you've never had an opportunity to see your kids worship in 4640, you need to see it. It is incredible. It is incredible. It will bring tears to your eyes. It will bless you so much that your kids are learning how to worship that way, that young. And my message to them was, never stop. Never stop worshiping him. Never stop dancing before him. Never stop raising your hands before him. Never stop singing to him because God loves a praiser. I told them the story about the guy that got in, the, in trouble the, probably the most in the Bible was King David, right? I mean, if there was a commandment, he broke it. But he had so much grace in his life because he was a praiser. He never let anybody make him ashamed about praising his heavenly father. People would make fun of him for it. He didn't care because he knew he was playing to an audience of one. He wrote the majority of the Psalms, a guy writing musicals, love songs to his heavenly father. That's one reason why David got so much grace. That's why he was so blessed. You want to get out of the issue that you're in, that you're facing right now, the problem you're facing, worship God more. Worship him more. After all this, Deborah writes a love song to her heavenly father in Judges 5, verse 2. She says, when Israel's leaders take charge and the people gladly follow, bless the Lord. Listen, you kings, pay attention, you mighty rulers, for I will sing to the Lord. I will lift up my song to the Lord, the God of of Israel. And then she goes on for 31 verses singing a song of praise to the one that is responsible for the victory. How many victories is God responsible for in your life? Have you praised him enough? 
could you ever praise him enough? When was the last time you wrote a love song to your heavenly father? That's the source of our strength. He's the one that is going to do battle for us. He's the one that's going to give us wisdom in every situation. And for you, he may tell you to pick up a stake and a hammer, or he may tell you to use the mind that he's given you and use the wisdom gift that he's given you. I don't know what he's going to do, but God through you can do amazing things. And you're empowered to do so. You are a victor. You are a mighty woman of God. And he has called you according to his purpose. Never forget that. Never stop worshiping him. Never stop listening to him. He wants to do life with you and make you so successful in it. So this is how we're going to end today. I want everybody to stand up. And as you stand, ladies, I want you all to come down front because I want to pray over you a prayer of empowerment. Whether you're a mom or not, it doesn't matter because one day you probably will be. And you're going to need wisdom. So come on down here. Make room, squeeze in because there's a lot of you. And Lord, as these ladies come, let it be a symbol of an act of obedience that they want you in their life in a greater way. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd fill each and every one of them as they take that step. Come on down. Wow. Does Fellowship Church have some awesome ladies or what? You guys are awesome. Thank you. Now, God, we thank you for every person that's come down. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would fill each and every one of them in a new way. Do a new thing in them. I pray that you would come against whatever comes against them. Whatever army in life comes against them. Whatever whatever problem. Lord God, that you would do battle for them. And for some of them right now, they need you to be the great physician in their life. So heal them. For others, they need you to be the comforter and counselor that only you can be. So bless them now with a peace that passes all understanding. Some, some of you right now, you're facing something. And you don't see a way out. And there hasn't felt like any hope. But in Jesus' name, I pray that hope would swell up like a spring within your soul. That you would get answers this week that you need so badly. And Lord, we pray that your heavenly army would go before us. It wouldn't matter if we're facing tanks. It wouldn't matter if we're facing demons. That God, you would take them out on our behalf. You're on our side. Whom then shall we fear? And Father, I pray right now that you would bind the spirit of guilt and cast it out of every person that's down here. Bind the spirit of fear and worry and cast it away from these women. And instead, I pray that you would lose life and love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness faithfulness and self-control those would be the fruits that would be loosed in the women that are down here right now in Jesus name and now Lord I pray that you would empower everybody that's down here you would make them a victor not a victim you would make them a mighty warrior for you and they would begin to see themselves the way you see them God when you look at these ladies, you see them as a you see them as royalty. You see them as princesses. You don't see them for past failures or poor decisions or mistakes. You see them for your loving daughters that you are well pleased with. 
remove the veil of deception that's upon anybody down here that's not allow allowing themselves to be able to see themselves the way you see them. Help them to love themselves. Help them to accept themselves. Now, Lord, for some of us, we just need emotional healing. Some of us have been hurt real bad, real deep, and you know that, you know that hurt better than we do. And I pray that you would give every lady down here a new level of healing in their life. You would heal their emotions. You would heal them from battered past. You would heal them from horrible relationships. You would heal them, Lord God, from whatever it is that has hurt them in the past. You, you're the great healer. You'll heal us physically and you'll heal us emotionally. So I pray for the fact for, the, for you to emotionally heal all of us. Lord, now we pray for the wisdom of Deborah. <laughs> because most of us have kids. And we need your help. Give us your wisdom on what to do with these gifts that you gave us. Give us your discernment. Help us to know the decisions we need to make. Help us to know, do we steer right? Do we steer left? We need to know what you want. Now for those of you down here that aren't moms yet. You're not moms yet, but you want to be. Maybe you have been plagued with infertility. I pray in Jesus' name right now that God would miraculously make you fertile. And that you would have that child that you've always dreamt of. And I pray over the future moms in this circle that you would bless them and give them wisdom. For many of them, they haven't even chosen a mate yet. Make their dreams come true. Give them a husband that will be better than any, any, any uh, prince charming they've ever imagined. And that that husband would love you first and love them second. Ladies, you deserve that. You deserve a Prince Charming. You deserve somebody that's going to love you. And that's going to love the Heavenly Father. So we loose these blessings upon these women. We thank you, God, for them. I pray, Lord, that they would walk away from this place with new wisdom, new boldness, new strength, empowered in a whole new way. You're raising up an army. You're raising up an army of Deborahs and JLs, and this room is filled with them. And let the enemy tremble at the sight of these mighty women of God. We love you, God. We praise you, and we praise you for these ladies. Let's give him another praise offering, because he's so worth it. Thank you, God.